Hey everybody, Nick and Uncle Magna here, look at Bionicle's Summer 2016 Wave. Let's start with the beasts. My opinion on these three has changed a lot over the months. There have been points where I thought I loved them, then felt underwhelmed, then got hyped again, then lost interest again. Finally, having built them and examined them in person, I'd say I'm satisfied. They're alright. They range from pretty good to half decent. Let's look at a few things they have in common before pointing out the things that make each one unique. One detail I found very interesting from the start is the way the Shadow Trap parts are incorporated into their bodies. In the case of Storm Beast, placing it at the end of a tail seems pretty obvious, but then it gets downright weird with Lava Beast and Quake Beast. Since these are Horde Beasts, one might assume they've been lying dormant in some underground cache like the Borog, waiting for someone like Umarak to come along and give them a wake-up call. My first impression though, I couldn't help imagining this thing starting its life as a simple shadow trap, mutated into a beast by Umarek's new power granted by the Mask of Control, like this entire new body just pooped out of it. Lava Beast's case is the most interesting to me, since he only has half of a shadow trap, making it look sort of like the other half became his bottom jaw. It's all very unique. Speaking of the heads, I didn't think I'd like the entire things being translucent, but it works surprisingly well for these things. The mask of corruption each one wears is very detailed, surprisingly expressive, and deliciously grody, and it looks very convincingly like a face, thanks in part to the bottom jaw. You can whack the beast in the jaw to knock these particularly face-like masks off, but then it just looks like you've exposed a weird glowing skull, like the Prometheans in Halo or something. These creatures feel artificial in a way, like they were conjured up out of almost nothing. And much like the skull villains felt connected by the trans-orange pieces they all shared, the new focus on trans-neon green makes these three feel almost radioactive, like they're just oozing greenish stuff wherever they walk, corrupting the earth. Their open maws almost make it look like they're drooling something toxic and corrosive. There is a lot of this color in both Storm Beast and Quake Beast, and even in Lava Beast, the lone neon skull draws your attention to it. I'd say the Lava Beast feels the most complete out of the three, so I guess it makes a little sense that there's less of the color on him or it. And even the Toast Corrupted masks have this color. I'd say these get the point across a lot better than last year's Corrupted Golden masks did. Worn by the Toa, they're pretty reminiscent of Tao's infected Hao in the Mask of Light movie. You know, how it was just one glowing green scar, and then it grew and his whole mask got messed up? Yeah, it looks sort of like that. Two things I really like about all three creatures are the claws and the legs. They all do basically the same thing with the legs, but it's nice that each of them has a slightly different construction. At first I was bummed that the Glatorian neck pieces and Lava Beast's legs were just the burnt orange ones left over from the Winter Wave and not trans orange or something, but after looking at them in person, I think it works very well bearing in mind that LEGO technically has two different kinds of trans orange plastic. The brighter reddish one we see used a lot in Bionicle G2, and the duller, more yellowish one used in pieces like these smaller claws. So the burnt orange and trans orange yellowish parts in the legs and feet create enough consistency together that it looks like his feet are a cooler temperature than the much more brightly colored, almost glowing body and arms. That's pretty smart. In general, the legs are good. The only one that really suffers any stability issues is Quake Beast, as his feet don't have extended heels of any kind, unlike the other two beasts. Oh well. The claws are where things really get interesting and add a bit more variety. I think Quake Beast's one hand turned out the best. It feels the most like a hand, at least in terms of its shape. Lava Beast digits have a bit more going on save the thumb and are very mean looking, and the orange nails add a good bit of color that so easily could have been left out, while the gray fingertips, again, add a sort of cooling effect and look almost ash-like. Storm Beast's claws are the biggest out of all of them, and as awkwardly constructed as they are, they're still the most effective and threatening by far. I still don't like the completely unused sockets sticking out of what are essentially feet as trying to pass off as hands, and the thumbs are pretty easy to pop off and the big lumpy wristless forearms are a bit primitive. Still, it's not as big of an issue as I thought it'd be, and they are very expressive, mean looking claws, especially in that color. That was a great choice. The legs and claws aren't that amazing on any of these guys, but they're pretty dang innovative and do a lot to make these creatures stand out from other bionicle waves while being perfectly consistent with each other. They're appropriately beastly in any case. One new component they all share are these jagged crystal pieces that look like something ruptured out of them. They come in a few different colors that fit each beast pretty well. Storm Beast does an okay job juggling light blue with the green, and Quake Beast Purple just looks excellent with it. I like Storm Beast's combination of solid earth blue and trans neon green from the beginning, it's great but I was worried that the trans light blue would muddle it. Thankfully, it blends with the other darker blue and ends up making the green bits stand out even more. Probably the most interesting color choice of all would be Lava Beast's smoky trans black. This is not a color we get in Bionicle. That is very unusual and oddly specific, and I like it a lot. It goes really nicely with the much brighter trans orange bones. I find it comparable to the way white pieces layered over trans blue pieces on an ice-themed character looks sort of like snow layered on top of ice. 
In a similar way, the solid black parts of Lava Beast's body look like coal or soot, and the smokier colors over the bright fiery colors make this thing literally look like portions of its body are on fire, and it looks really fun to draw in cartoon form. The rib cages also work to the beast's favor. While it makes them a bit more reminiscent of the skull villains than I'd like, it goes well with the new crystal paces and even the heads. Like, you know how the Toa have this whole crystal theme going on this year? Well, so do these things, except the Toa feel like there's still some level of restraint there. These beasts look at their powers just growing out of control, and all the jagged elements come together to convey that, especially on Quake Beast. I almost feel sorry for this thing. There's so many big spiky protrusions, it just looks painful, like its body is being ripped open by stuff growing from its bones. Even the chest printing shows crystals coming out of it, while the others look fairly tame, just craggy leathery plates of skin with energy coursing underneath them that hasn't quite exploded yet. It feels like their bodies are just barely tough enough to contain the power they were created by, and it makes them feel aggressive, like they're so full of energy, so hyped up, they gotta let it out somehow, preferably by raising everything they see. Before I get to my final thoughts on the three, let's look at their gimmicks. Lava Beast is probably the best at having gimmicks that don't detract from the figure's overall quality. On top of including this year's waist-turning function, its arms have gears that make these... <laughs> wings swing open so one of the blades on each arm can be used as just that a blade it's a neat gimmick and in no way does the construction suffer to make it happen the same can't quite be said for the other two quick piece has a sideways mounted gearbox from last year with a lever that makes him swing his spiky club-like arm from the side he's sort of like bruiser from brain attack only you know better because on top of that motion and these little green blades being able to spin around the arm has a ton of posability it still works as an arm and not just a beam or a stump so Quick Beast works both as a figure on display and as an action-packed toy. The arm itself looks vicious, and I like that this shoulder is raised a bit higher than the other. Heck, this whole figure is aggressively asymmetrical, and I love it. I can see some people getting two of these, just so they can make completely mirrored versions of them and stand them side by side, with one that clocks from their left. The thing that bugs me about this gimmick, though, is how it can get in the way of things. The shoulder and head are so big and spiky that they tend to bump together, and the swinging action itself isn't really that effective. But the engineering works about as well as I think it was possible for it to. Storm Beast does suffer a little bit for his gimmick, but it's probably the most interesting gimmick since Bionicle Return. The tail and the two arms are connected by beams and swivels, so turning or pulling the tail will tug the arms and move them around in all sorts of ways, really. He's like a puppet. It's sort of like Skullbasher's gimmick, but there is a much bigger range of movement here. It is pretty fun to make Storm Beast lash out and wildly flail its arms, and the figure doesn't end up being nearly as flimsy as I was expecting it to be in order to make this movement possible, only a little bit really. It's a pretty involving gimmick, more than I'm letting on, and kudos to LEGO for continuing to find new ways to make these figures come alive. It's not perfect, but it works well, and it even gives Storm Beast a very unique if gangly appearance that looks better as a shape you can feel around in your hands than as a flat image on a screen. What I really like about these things over everything else would ultimately make me consider them worth buying together, is how mean they come across as. If I had to say they have any sort of theme, it's just being out of control, something unchained, unleashed to raise hell, a wave of elemental bestial fury rampaging through the environment just for the sake of it, because it makes them feel more alive, or because it's the only thing they know how to do. It's instinct, it's in their nature, their pure savagery. I admit, when I first saw images of these, I thought there was something ho-hum about them, that they wouldn't have a distinct style like the Skull Villains did, that they'd be kind of plain, but I'm surprised by just how much of an impression they managed to make, despite everything I thought they had going against them. I was especially surprised by how cool Lava Beast is. Like, dang! The horns, the claws, the giant head, the imp-like stature. This is one of the most demonic things I have ever seen produced under the Bionicle name, even more than most of the Makuta of 2008. It's probably the closest LEGO has ever come or will ever get to releasing a straight-up devil. Yeah, the beasts are kind of smallish, but they accomplish a lot for $15 sets, and they look really freaking strong for their stature, which I honestly couldn't say for the Skull Villains since, you know, they're so bony. These are built kind of beefy, like a Pitbull or a Rottweiler, like they have a higher muscle density than most of the Toa do. They look like they could tear you up. As individual beasts, eh, they're kind of so-so, but as a horde, something the Toa would have to face several of at any given time? Oh man, they're scary. Even just one of them looks like it'd be a problem and may take down several Skull Villains by itself. And if they actually can cause storms and earthquakes and eruptions in their wake, effectively giving them elemental powers, these may be one of the biggest threats a Toa ever faced in either generation. As nifty as the Skull Villains are, they don't feel nearly as threatening or complete as these monsters. It couldn't really be helped that they looked like one good hit could make them come apart, and their portrayal in the animations didn't do anything to help their case. They were okay, they, they were interesting, but this is a pretty big step up. 
I like all three breeds well enough, though I'd rank Lava Beast as the best with the other two being tied, as they both excel in some areas that the other doesn't, and it's hard for me to pick which one feels the worst, since, as I seem to say in every wave, even the worst of G2 is never that bad. The quality is still pretty consistent four waves in. I'm probably jumping ahead a bit though, since we still have two figures to look at. Let's shift focus to Akima before facing Umarak's final four. Okay, so, I don't really know what the backstory is for this thing, but it's pretty cool. I love the whole spiritual vibe this figure has. It's a bit skimpy, but I think that's the idea. It's like the formerly very compact mass of his tiny burly dwarf-like body got stretched and pried apart, leaving a skeleton with a few hanging gold armor bits here and there. And the trans blue elements represent some astral energy that's filling all the empty space to constitute his new being or, or something like that. He looks like he's not quite as present in this state, like half of his mind is here, while the other half is in some other realm that we mortals can't see. Last year, Akima quickly wound up being one of my favorite figures of that year and probably the best in my eyes simply because of how much it managed to accomplish with such a small body. Here, the designers try to step things up, not by simply stretching him out and calling it a day, but by seeing what else it could get away with with the added room. And what do you know? He's the only figure released so far who has both the arm swinging and waist swivel gimmicks, sort of bringing the two years we've enjoyed so far together in one figure. That's pretty remarkable. I've seen some mangas do the same thing before, but it's nice to see an official figure that combines the two gimmicks so seamlessly. Actually trying to use both of them at the same time by twisting the two knobs together is pretty awkward. It can make for a really cool motion if you get it right, but I'm just glad both gimmicks are there as options. I felt like getting that out of the way before talking about Akima's looks, since this is where I'm kinda mixed. As cool as it is to see last year's gimmick combined with this year's gimmick, we've ended up regressing a little bit since now Akimu's shoulders rest pretty far behind his head, which was a problem with last year's Toa that I didn't pay much mind at the time, but it grew to irritate me the more I thought about it, and I have since rectified it in most of my sets from that year. Seeing the Toa evolve from such a weird look this year makes me wish they could have done this a little bit better. There are ways around it, but to pull it off without sacrificing the waist gimmick, he has to make his torso super long, which would not help. What probably bugs me even more though is the way, like some of this year's Toa, he also suffers maxillos leg syndrome, with short short shins attached to not super long but still pretty long thighs, and the place on the thighs don't help since they don't cover very much of the bones, but I can kind of forgive that part if it is supposed to be some spiritual energy loosely binding the frames or whatever. I just want to know who at LEGO thinks it's such a bad idea to give these figures decent length shins. In fact, when you combine the fairly short legs with the also pretty short arms that hang back, Akima looks kind of stumpy. Like, something doesn't add up. His arms and legs look way too short for the body if you stand him up perfectly straight. It's no deal breaker, but come on. On the positive side, I gotta say, the placement of gold elements being far away from the body with this light blue core is pretty neat. I love the way the gold texture paste on the back bulks him up a bit and looks like some sort of brace. And there's a bit of gold printing on his chest, but for the most part, he does look like his original body got peeled open. Pieces that may have seemed too big for his old body fit this new incarnation like a glove. And even his shield and hammer seem to have been affected by the transformation. The blue part of the saw looks like it could be pure holy energy that burns evildoers and passes through allies harmlessly. And the head of the hammer looks like it's about to summon lightning or something. It really stands out seeing how much cleaner Akimu looks than most of the Toa. I also love, love the way the shield is attached. I want to see more building techniques like this used in future figures. Maybe this is how a future version of Kopaka could have his shield incorporated into his design, freeing up his hand to hold something else. Akima's chest printing is pretty simple, but still leaves an impression, with all of the Nuva symbols and a symbol of his own giving him an air of authority. The transparent mask of creation completes his new spiritual vibe. And I know not everyone is going to like it, but I think it looks great. And kudos to LEGO for not making it a gold blended mask since that would make it way too specific to be used in many mocks. The trans blue is a much more neutral color that shouldn't clash too hard with other Others the way a golden mask on a character that doesn't have any gold on them might. Interestingly, wearing the gold version makes him feel a bit more earthly and grounded, like he hasn't quite ascended, while the blue version makes him look stuck between two dimensions, like his voice would have this weird echo or reverb effect when he talks. It's amazing how effective such a small change can be. And that's all I have to say about him. For $15, Akimu is a pretty cool figure. A bit plain, yes, and the proportions aren't that good, but the gimmicks are great, the colors are as striking as ever, and he feels otherworldly and powerful. Not so much like he's been upgraded by some new force or this is a power he didn't have before. More like this is a side of him that we just never got to see until now and he's probably avoided tapping into before this new crisis began. Does the mask make a live up to last year's counterpart? Eh, to a point. He's not amazing, but he wears this new body about as well as could be expected, I suppose. He also comes with Umarak's discard and possibly damaged old mask. I don't know what the story behind this is, but it's such a cool subversion of things to see one of the heroes carrying one of the villain's masks as a trophy. 
Needs some work, but not the worst. Now though, we come to the centerpiece of this wave, Umrak the Destroyer. I said in the last Bionicle review that I'd save most of my thoughts on Umrak the Hunter for this video and compare the two versions of him. Problem is, I kind of already said everything I wanted to about him in that video. There's not much more to him I can add, and it shouldn't surprise anyone that I still think he's one of the year's greatest figures. One thing I completely neglected to touch upon though, is the Mask of Control. I won't spend long gushing about it. I like it for a lot of the same reasons I like the Mask of Creation. I like the runes, I like the slightly more alien shape, I like that it doesn't even really look evil. Like if someone else was wearing it, it may not seem that suspect. It fits Umrak perfectly though, even making room for his antlers without that noticeably cutting into its incredibly distinct shape. I think it's beautiful in its own awkward way, much like the way a, a pug is or something. In this latest incarnation, oh my gosh, it's still clearly the same mask with the same runes and eyes and such, but the teeth and other growths make it look alive, like the mask is wearing Umarak. And while I'll miss Umarak's antlers, I love the way they stretched out the mask's ear like tusks to create such an extreme new shape. The one thing that really bugs me about this part though, the black connectors. How did this happen? Like, I understand not making a new recolor for Lava Beast legs, whatever, but this? Was it really so hard, so expensive, to just make a gold version of this small, simple, and very widely used piece? It completely breaks the illusion they're going for. The horns would have looked so much less jarring, and the mask so much more complete, if they just made these parts gold. But I guess that's what spray paint is for. Anyway, the rest of the Destroyer is a pile of very cool old and new things. A lot of his old self's features are retained, like the shoulder pads, the mechanical looking legs, the clawed feet, the ribs, even that dangly little chain. There's enough of all that important stuff to make his new features feel all the more an extreme departure. His arms are enormous, but surprisingly not that heavy, and are easy to pose. His legs have a good range, though his feet can only bend forward and backwards a little bit for stability purposes. Ugh. I do wish his thighs were a little longer. The chest looks cool, with huge fissures leaking more of that green substance that seems to be oozing out of his every pore, like he's just a vehicle for the corruption to spread itself. His neck is a little weird, very blocky and stiff. Still, his stature is pretty good. He's not much taller than he was before, as he was quite tall already, but his mass has increased immensely. He is bigger in every other direction but up. He looks much more powerful than Akimu or the Toa, and he towers over his underling beasts. It's so satisfying to finally have the reboot's first proper Titan set. While he has enough of his old traits to feel like a grossly mutated Umarak, most of his new features, the jaw, the claws, the abundance of green tumor-like growths erupting everywhere, are things he shares with the beasts. It's clear that they're all derivative of this monster, that they came from him somehow, much the same way Kolta was the heart of his skull army. Or is the Destroyer himself derivative of the Mask of Control? There was something about his old darker green that felt more natural for him. This other green feels wrong, and I mean that in the best way. It's sickly and invasive, and it clashes beautifully against all the black. And I love that as much green as he has, his eyes are still that old reddish orange, showing a glimmer of who he once was and making him feel more intelligent than the beasts, like he's not that far gone. I will say though, his overall construction, while good, still leaves a little to be desired. He's not quite as elegant or flexible as, say, last year's General Grievous figure. He's just kind of clunky and brickish. But he still has decent posability and some great gimmicks to boot. As heavy as he is, the waist still turns fine, and his new grabby hands gimmick is great fun, and even the claws themselves are pretty expressive when just left posed in various ways. There's not much else I can say about the Destroyer. He's far from perfect, but he's a ton of fun and I hope this is a sign of things to come. That next year, we get something more on the level of Witch Doctor, that LEGO is willing to invest more in this theme and push what they can accomplish with this line that far. Time will tell. And, uh, that's kind of it for this year. Finally, a shorter video. I do still intend to make a vid showing my mocks and revamps, but that won't be for a while since some of these aren't even finished. I know it feels a tad early to be saying this in June, but 2016 has been a good year for Bionicle, at least in terms of sets. In fact, it goes so far as to say it's even better than last year was. A bit clumsy, but so intense. I feel like they took a lot of bold new steps that the line needed to in order to evolve for the new age. And sure, not every choice completely paid off. But it was worth a shot, and the choices that did pay off have raised the bar substantially. It's hard for me to say which set is the best of 2016, or even just this wave. Umarak is big and Mikimu is cool, but... I don't know, the lines are blurrier than they've been in quite a few years, especially with the whole combining gimmick making the winter sets cooler than anything else in G2 when together than they are apart. It's just been a really interesting year so far. What can I say? I like Hitar, I like Storm Beast. I'd say Skull Scorpio is still the worst G2 set. I don't know how well these sets are actually selling, or even if we'll see Bionicle survive into 2018. Like many another theme, Bionicle G2's third year may very well be its last. But you know what? 
I'm kind of okay with that. If we just get one more run with these heroes, another evolutionary push that ends the growing pains and makes these characters feel complete, and a good end to the story they have going that makes sense and includes a wink and a nod to us older fans, and as long as Constraction itself doesn't die and they manage to replace Bionicle with a fresh new theme or something, eh, whatever. I would prefer for it to continue to give G2 more time to evolve, but if the kids of today really are so different from us that this kind of thing doesn't catch their attention anymore, Oh well, I can't hold it against them. I can't just be mad at them for sooner choosing an iPad over a buildable action figure, but even if next year's G2 reviews end up being my last, I'm still looking forward to making them. I still want to build. I still want to see what happens. I'm prepared for the end. But they better not try to get away with one of those half-wave things where they end at the beginning of a year, like they did to Power Miners and Atlantis, and heck, they even did it to Ninjago. And then they brought it back. And heck, that's the way Bionicle ended last time! I know Bionicle is never going to sell as well as it did back in the day, that the circumstances that made it possible for something like Bionicle to explode the way it did can nowadays be chalked up to some freak accident, a fluke, and the stars won't line up the same way in this day and age. They can't. But even in its current, somewhat derivative form, the sets are some of the best we've ever had in any construction line, and Bionicle deserves better than to end on a whimper and feel unfinished. Like. These beasts are a step up from the Skull Villains, no doubt. Even a single one of them feels significantly tougher than any Skull Warrior, Scorpio, or even Basher. And in greater numbers, they've really raised the stakes. But I don't want to see them do the same thing next year. I don't want to see another mindless horde of nobodies, unless it's like one set that backs up the other villains, something like a Vorox or a Skrull. I want to see a proper line of villains, something on par with the Rakshi and the Paraka and the Baraki. Maybe do something like they did in 2008 and release three Toe and three villains in a winter wave, and then three of each in the summer wave, like release three $15 Toa and three $20 villains, and then three $20 Toa and three $15 villains, or do it the other way around. Like, have Makuta summon six super cool villains whose power rivals a Toa, and give them each a personality, give the kids of today something new before this all ends. And then, you know, if the storyline does continue after that, maybe create a new line of characters with their own story on another island. Three Tahus are enough for me. Well, I guess that's it for this year's sets, folks. Thanks for joining me again. Now it's nothing but game reviews for the rest of the year. Next up, we get to see where all this music I keep using came from. Also, after suffering for nearly a decade, my Maxillus has made a complete recovery from his own disease. Yay! Also, I love, love, love the way Quake Beast stabs through the top of the box art.